how Special Branch spied on the animal rights movement. I set up a blog and a Facebook page, Twitter, AR Spycatcher, just to look at spies in the animal rights movement, which is where I've mainly been active over the years, so I've encountered a lot of them. I'm also well aware that all of what I'm going to be talking about happened a very, very long time ago. Yeah. If you're young, even the 80s was a long time ago. You may not be born then. So, what I'm at pains to show is one of the reasons for doing this is just to say it isn't just of historical interest, although that's very, very important that we find out the truth of what happened in the past to signpost as to what's going on now and possibly in the future, but it's a live issue and that's how I'll explain why it's happening now and I'll explain the, the impact of what's, what's been going on recently. This sort of information isn't so much in the public, the public domain as much as some of the earlier spies who've been sort of well, relatively well covered. Right, <laughs> so we're going back, this will kill you, nearly 50 years, yeah? It's a long time, 1968, the 60s, yeah? We all know what sort of tumultuous decade that was. And it was through mass unrest, protests, demonstrations, sit-ins, occupations to do with Vietnam, that the ruling class got really worried that they thought there might be a revolution. In September 68, Chief Inspector Comrade Dixon of Special Branch crafted a, a memo which said, the more vociferous spokesmen of the left are calling for the complete overthrow of parliamentary democracy. They claim this can only be achieved by action on the streets. They desire a state of anarchy. And then he supposedly said, supposedly, give me one million pounds and ten men and I can deal with the problem for you. The then Labour government under Harold Wilson was only too happy to oblige. Now you might think a left-wing government might have reservations about setting up a unit to spy on left-wing activists, but no, no way. And in fact, as we'll show later, it's a bit of a tradition that La Labour loves spy cops. So they funded Dixon's plan straight from the Treasury and the Special Demonstration Squad was formed. They were known to some as the Hairies, yeah? And it was a new concept of policing, yeah? Police officers became activists, yeah? They infiltrated groups, often for years on end, changed their appearance. In that era, it went growing your hair very long, had false ID documents, found flats or bedsits, which were spartanly furnished, jobs with flexible working hours or travel, such as delivery drivers or labourers and they nearly always had a van or another vehicle yeah, to drive around in. The Met now says there were 116 undercover officers in the SDS from 1968 to 2008 and over 400 groups were spied on. Yeah? Many agents used dead children's identities to establish what they called their legend. This meant if someone searched birth records, a certificate would be found. Yeah? Most had intimate relationships with their targets, which was what they called the people they spied on at some point during their deployment. And these could go on for a very long time. One who, who wasn't in animal rights, who came in the 90s, called Mark Jenner, lived with a campaigner for four years, in her words, like a man and wife, 
Another characteristic of spy cops was how they ended their tours of duty, as they like to call them. Usually they feigned some sort of mental crisis and therefore left in a hurry, often saying they were, they were going abroad, never to be heard of again. More on this later. Initially, the SDS infiltrated the far left and the anti-apartheid movement, groups like that. But with the rise of animal rights from the 80s onwards, that became a target. The first known SDS agent was Mike Chitty, who joins South London Animal Movement from 1983, yeah? A group which campaigned like many did, you know, events with his section for the meat trade. Um, but Chitty seemed to enjoy the social life of the group more than the campaigning. And although he fed back information, he was in what the, the SDS called a shallow paddler. Yeah. Didn't get deeply involved, and especially deeply involved in unlawful activities. What's interesting about him, though, is that after his deployment ended in 87, he sporadically returned to socialise with people he'd known. He couldn't seem to get it out of his system. And later on in the 90s, it led to a sort of mental collapse. Yeah. Now, our next person is cut from a very different cloth. Someone you might have heard of, Bob Lambert, yeah? This was regarded in special branch circles as the legendary tour of duty. He was outgoing, charismatic, big hair, big smile, the quintessential spy cop. And for those of us who knew him, he was like unforgettable person. Although nowadays it's for all the wrong reasons, of course, yeah. He joined London Greenpeace, a small green anarchist environmental group, in 1984 and quickly became prominent in it. One of the group's most important campaigns was against McDonald's and Lambert played a key role in that. He co-authored the What's Wrong with McDonald's fact sheet, which you can there see him handing out with me in a photo taken in 1986. A few years later, McDonald's sued five members of the group. Three of them, including me, apologised. Dave Mor Morris and Helen Steele fought on with McLibel, the longest trial in English legal history. And that guy there was to, to blame for it. By then, of course, he'd long gone. It's not a very clear photo of what I'm trying to show there, but it's actually him on a stool holding up an ALF supporters group fact sheet from that time. I wanted to show that because of Lambert's very close association with the ALF and direct action. He has since said his primary objective was to infiltrate the ALF. Yeah. And of that he did a very good job. Because for the people who knew him, he was a staunch advocate of direct action. He published documents inciting people to carry out ALF actions, including a leaflet called You Are the ALF. And he did them himself. Yeah. Their particular target was Biorex Laboratory in Islington, which then had uh, a, very, a, very, a very strong active local group protesting against it. He joined in those protests, but he took it a step further, for instance, by telling me that he once dressed as a jogger and ran past the car of one of its directors while pouring paint stripper over it. Yeah. He also liked using glass etching fluid a lot. That was a particular favourite of his. Um, <clears throat> but even that wasn't enough. In 1987, he became part of an ALF cell which attacked Debenhams with incendiary devices, causing £8 million damage. 
Jeff Shepard and Andrew Clark are appealing their convictions due to his involvement. The following year, 88, he told me that he'd planted another device in Selfridges. And later, a press release was received, codenamed Operation Silver Fox, about it, that he had written. He finally left in late 88, early 89, allegedly fleeing from the police, who were actually his employer, weren't they? But that, that was his reason to get out, yeah? By the time Lambert had departed, his successor, John Dines, had been in London Greenpeace for, for a year, yeah? He rose to prominence in the group, became its treasurer, used his van to ferry people, take them home after meetings. Um, he went hunt sabbing, drove activists to sab a grouse shoot, those sorts of things. He was on the horse and hound ball, throwing bags of flour. In late 91, he feigned mental illness and again, fled, yeah? Didn't, no one knew where he was. <clears throat> 91 is quite a, an important year in terms of spy cops and the development of animal rights because that year a new group was set up in London, a London-wide group, London Boots Action Group, big campaign against Boots the Chemist because it tested on animals. We had an inaugural meeting in November 91 and it was very, very well attended. What we didn't know, there were two spy cops there and he was one of them, Andy Davey. The other, Matt Rayner. They were in the group at the same time. They both attracted suspicion from certain people, but they settled into the life of the group. And in those days, you didn't think spies came and stayed in groups for months or years. Davy was IT literate at a time when computers were rare. And in 1993, he started producing the group's newsletter. And the following year, he transferred the whole of the LBAG membership list to a database, fortunately with my help, which meant Special Branch had it all. <clears throat> he also had a hand in the London Animal Rights Coalition, which was set up in 94. He went sabbing. He wasn't universally liked, some found him a bit suspicious, others didn't like his personality. Although it's known he had a long-term relationship. Anyway, he went abroad in 95 again, so you see the cycle that, that repeats itself. Uh, claiming to have found a job teaching English in Eastern Europe. Matt Rayner. Deployed at the same time. He became an important figure in animal rights in London and elsewhere. Eventually became treasurer of London Animal Action. Took people to demos all over the country, including a sabotage of the Grand National in 93 that cost the betting and horse racing industry £70 million. He was known all over the country and he took part in direct action as well. Jeff Shepherd is appealing his 1995 conviction for which he served a seven year sentence, citing Rayner's involvement. What's important to understand is, is that by 1993, Bob Lambert had come back on the scene. Yeah. He was now operations manager. He had control, the day-to-day -day running of the SDS. And he was using an experience to guide Rayner in how to spy on activists. And some of them were the same people he'd been spying on years earlier. Now, a little while ago, I just I mentioned the exit strategies, and I've talked about a few of them, but I just thought I'd go into a bit more detail about Rainer's, because it was a masterpiece of, uh, of, a, of a strategy. And it's no doubt that Lambert engineered it. You can see there a letter that he wrote from France, the date on, the 6th of the 12th, 96, to me. He'd always been interested in France and could speak French pretty fluently throughout his deployment. And he, he initially worked for a company delivering musical instruments, I think, 
But then about halfway through his deployment, he switched to working for a wine company over here. Now, he then said he was moving to a branch in Bordeaux, yeah? He went over and he actually let some of his friends who are activists travel over and visit him there at the address he had. He also sent letters and in one of them, a few months later, we're talking about 96, 97 here, he said he was relocating with, the, with, his, with his job to Argentina. Yeah. In the final letter I received, Brainer said that he was started seeing someone and was suffering from laziness when it comes to letter writing. You see, he was in creating the impression he was slowly losing contact with his former animal rights friends, enabling him to disappear. Although he was living, claimed to be living on the other side of the world, he was probably working a short distance away at Scotland Yard, because that's where they tended to go back to, at least in the short term. So these were the two later spies we had in LAA, those who succeeded Rayner. Christine Green, not a very good photo, we don't have anything better at the moment. Fairly unique as being a female SDS operative. The book, Undercover, does refer to there being some SDS agents in the 80s in the peace movement, but she's the only one who's been named. Obviously that's her cover name, not her real name. <clears throat> she had a long-term relationship with a hunt sab and left in 2000. She said to go to Australia. Dave Evans, you can see there, again not a terribly good picture, said he was from New Zealand and worked as a gardener. He sometimes acted strangely, such as going on a demo and then leaving soon after. And this together with his sort of dishevelled appearance led some to speculate he had mental health issues. He turned up at a party once with a woman, a girlfriend he said, named Wanda. And it's the only time I think they were seen together. There might have been one other occasion. And it's believed that she was also a police officer. Evan shared a flat with another spy cop, Simon Wellings, who infiltrated the anti-capitalist movement. And the two of them drove protesters to the G8 summit in 2005. So they went into Scotland. And that was their, his last known appearance. In 1997, New Labour won a landslide under Tony Blair. They'd promised to legislate to protect animals, but once in power, they set up the National Public Order Intelligence Unit. With a budget of over 30 million and a staff of 70, it dwarfed the SDS. And its primary objective, at least in its early days, were stopping the animal rights movement, which had been successful in closing down several lab animal breeders. It also targeted grassroots environmental campaigns, such as those against climate change. Here are four undercovers from the NPRIU. Broad Richardson was involved in anti-capitalist groups, but also went on animal rights demonstrations mainly Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty, an anti-vivisection group. Adrian Radford infiltrated a shack as Ian Farmer and became a leading figure in the group, leaving in January 2007, four months before there were mass arrests of people involved in organising it. Gary Rayner infiltrated the Speak campaign which was trying to stop a new animal laboratory being built at Oxford University. And Richie Clark was active in local campaigns in the Bedford area and also active in Shack and Speak. Right, we're coming up to about 2010 now, the unravelling. In the space of about a year, the closely guarded secret of spy cops collapsed like a house of cards. Central to this, was a spy named Jim Boiling, who spied on Hunt Sabs and the group Reclaim the Streets in the 1990s and took part in some major anti-globalisation, anti-capitalist protests of that period. His partner, Laura, managed to track him down after he left her. He confessed to her 
But she decided to forgive him and they married and had two children. But she eventually left him because he was abusive to her. She was a friend of Helen Steele who'd been trying to locate John Dines, one of the earlier spy cops you may remember, for 18 years, yeah? They had had a relationship, long-term relationship as well. By this time, Helen knew that he'd used the, a dead child's identity and had been a, a police officer. But Laura finally confirmed that Boiling was a spy and told her that Boiling had said to her, I feel sorry for Helen. She was spied on three times by Lambert, Dines and me. In, in October 2011, several London Greenpeace members, including Helen, confronted Bob Lambert, who was speaking under his new guise as an academic at a trade union conference. They chased him down the road before he jumped into a cab and left. Also what happened around this time was the unmasking of Mark Kennedy, who again I'm sure many of you have heard of, a spy who was active for, for many years, for six or seven years. And uh, that again led, led to the whole thing being becoming, becoming a huge public issue. <clears throat> I said I want you to bring it up to the present, and we're nearly here at the present now, aren't we? The present is, undercover cops are still being used. In 2014, the Guardian reported that there were 1,200 undercover police officers operating in 39 units across England and Wales. However, it's not known how many of those are spying on political groups. Debbie Vincent is just coming to the end of a six-year sentence for her involvement in SHAC. I visited her on Sunday and she's doing well and looking to get out forward to her release in a couple of months. In 2010, she had meetings with the pharmaceutical company Novartis. But unbeknownst to her, an undercover officer used the alias James Adams to masquerade as the special contracts manager for the company. He tried to coax information out of her regarding campaigns of direct action and even followed her onto the underground. She was convicted of conspiracy to blackmail and got six years. Ben and Natasha, they're a couple who were living in Amsterdam who've just been extradited. They came over to the country at the weekend, again for conspiracy to blackmail. The link to them, between them and Debbie, is supposedly at the International Animal Rights Gathering in 2009. And I think this is one of the main reasons for their charge, yeah? Now it's claimed on the, that Gary Rayner, this one of the earlier MPRIU spies, was there. And he was there with other activists from the UK and he took photographs of the three of them together, Sven, Natasha and Debbie, which were, which were used as evidence, or may be used as evidence. So that's a live issue. Now, nearly all attention in the last few years has been focused on undercover police, and rightly so, yeah? But, in terms of numbers, informants possibly pose the greater threat, yeah? In the series True Spies, there is an interview with Special Branch Ken Day, a retired officer, in which he says that there were 100 agents, if not more, in the animal rights movement. This would have been about 20 years ago. And the vast majority of those would have been informants. These fall into, broadly speaking, three categories. People who are arrested or get into trouble and do a deal with the police in return for a more lenient sentence or not being charged at all. I mean, it's, this type is almost as old as the movement itself. Cliff Goodman was, was snitched on Ronnie Lee in 1975 after both were arrested for burning down a laboratory that was under construction. The second type is professional grasses who enter the movement posing as activists. That's possibly the hardest type to spot. They're sometimes very convincing. And the third, third category is genuine activists whose beliefs change or who fall out with their 
with their fellow activists and are then recruited by the state. And we know that this has happened. People have experienced it themselves, being approached and asked to go away and have a chat with police and, and what have you. So that's the role of informants. It's something that is relatively, you know, downplayed at the moment while we concentrate on undercover cops, but it's very, very important. Yeah. Finally, just this organisation I was telling you about earlier, AR Spycatcher, there's a blog and the rest, it's Facebook, Twitter, email. If you need to contact the group, you can do it that way.